morning, madam. Good okay. morning. So, afternoon also you have some guests like Enderman lecture, right? Yes, sir. I am eagerly waiting for after, afternoon lecture also, madam. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, you are the Trichy campus and TNA also will be connected. So, please make sure your connections afternoon. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. A very warm and pleasant good morning to the respected guest speaker, respected Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, Director Seed Center, attending through online, Professor and Head Department of Seed Science and Technology, Scientist, and my dear students. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. On behalf of Department of Seed Science and Technology, Seed Center, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Coimbatore, we feel overwhelmed to extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, guests, scientists and students attending through both online and offline for the Golden Jubilee Global Lecture Series guest lecture on Understanding Seed Behavior, Population of Individuals. Let's start the session with the prayer. We kindly request you all to stand up for Tamil Taiwalt. கடலுடுத்த நிலமடந்து கிளிலொழுகும் சீராரும் வதனமென திகழ் பரத கண்டமிதில் திக்கணமும் அதிர் சிறந்த திராவிடனல் திறனாடும் தக்க சிறு பிறை நுதலும் தரித்தனரும் திலகமுமே அத்திலக வாசனை போல் அனைத்துலகும் இன்பமுற எத்திசையும் புகழ் மணக்க இருந்த பெரும் தமிழனங்கே தமிழனங்கே உன் சீரிழமை தீரம் வியந்து செயல் மறந்து வாழ்த்துதுமே 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 With deep reverence, we would like to invite our respected Professor and Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Coimbatore, to welcome the gathering. Good morning to all and good evening to Dr. Kent and respected Dean of Postgraduate Studies, Director of Seeds, the guest speaker Dr. Gint Bradford, alumni of uh, Department of Seed Science and Technology, my dear scientists, PG and PG students, present both online and offline, wholeheartedly welcome you all uh, to this Golden Jubilee Global Lecture Series. This is a lecture uh, two. Uh, sir, our uh, renowned Double Nod Agriculture University is a century old primary institute in South India, providing higher education in agriculture. With the distinguished leadership of our most respected, beloved Madam Vice Chancellor, because of Madam motivation only, we are organizing this type of Golden Jubilee Lecture Series for the benefit of the students and faculties. At present, this prestigious Department of Seed Science and Technology has completed its 50 glorious years. And in order to commemorate the great occasion, we are organizing guest lectures, lectures by inviting eminent scientists worldwide. So considering the vast experience of Dr. Kent Bradford, not only in seed science, he is also expert in physiology and seed biotechnology. I request him to deliver lecture for the benefit of the students and faculty of TNIU. He is very kind enough to accept our request happily. Thank you, sir, for your generous mind for accept, accepting our invitation and to take part in our glorious celebration of golden year of this great event. At this juncture, I want to give brief about Kent Bradford. He is a distinguished professor, emeritus, and former director of uh, Seed Biotechnology Center, UC Davis, California. Completed his postgraduate education at Michigan State University, USC, and doctoral studies in plant physiology during 1981 from UC Davis. Dr. Broadford's research interests span diverse areas of seed science, from seed germination and conservation to mathematical modeling and molecular biology. He has published more than 200 peer-reviewed research and extension articles, co-authored a textbook on seed development, germination, dormancy, and storage. As the director of the Seed Biotechnology Center, he supports the creation 
and commercialization of new technologies to improve the performance, quality, and sustainability. So, with this brief introduction about the speaker, guest speaker, in this happy occasion, I once again welcome you all to this lecture series. And I am sure we will have a good deliberations and discussions with guest speakers. Thank you for the opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful address. Because of online issues, our director could not join through online now. Next, we feel privileged to extend our warm welcome to our respected Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Coimbatore, to deliver a special address in this great occasion. Good morning to all. The Professor and Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, Dr. Manon Mani. The Director, Dr. Umarani Seed Center. She has uh, some busy schedule. She could not join uh, today. And uh, Jerlin, Professor C Technology, former head. And uh, senior professors, faculty members of the Seed Science and Technology. Dr. Vanangamadi, sir, uh, the former head of the department and the dean of agriculture. And most important person is today's guest speaker, Dr. Kent, from Department of Plant Science, University of California, Davis, US. And the my student friends uh, from C Technology, not only in Coimbatore campus, other campus connected by online. Apart from that, there are a lot of online participants, for the around 50 participants online. And also, this lecture also been uh, recorded and also the people, those who are busy today, they can watch their lectures whenever they have time. I'm really happy that uh, Department of Seed Technology and Seed Center organizing uh, Golden Jubilee lecture series. Uh, the first lecture has been completed. Now we have the second lecture. So it's I already told the last meeting also it is uh, one of the unique uh, type of uh, online lecture series. So nowadays uh, we have a lot of platform like so I am platform and PTL. Many of the online platform not only been promoted by government of India uh, and also we have Agri Diksha portal in uh, uh, in uh, ICAR and uh, more uh, online, massive online courses been introduced uh, by ma many universities and a lot of lectures already been available in online. So after the Corona pandemic, uh, we are used to uh, this kind of online lectures. So uh, it is uh, one of the advantage I can say uh, because of um, uh, the technological uh, advancement. Uh, earlier they we used uh, Zoom and uh, then Microsoft team and played a major role in case of connecting the eminent speakers with the big international institute to the different universities. And also even Google Meet, even nowadays PowerPoint given the option that there is recorded uh, lectures can be shared and uh, you can use it. And uh, many of the lectures already been recorded, not only the YouTube platform and also their own colleges, they have their own portals and also uh, different web platform it has been uh, recorded. So I am telling all the thing is that uh, we have the very eminent speaker today, uh, Dr. Kent. So there's this uh, this lecture we cannot, you cannot afford, you cannot travel to, to other continent. We cannot, uh, if you want to see, witness his lecture, you should travel a lot and you have to be there in some meetings or seminars or his departmental meetings, then only you can able to hear his lecture. So it is a good opportunity that uh, sitting in Coimbatore and uh, very, very okay. nice environment and just watching the lecture, what what he is going to deliver in exactly where in his university. So that much of technological revolution help us to learn their things. So another for the, for the students of first year, 
uh, the beginners in their research. Uh, you have the you have the on hand experience on how the uh, the professors from other universities, those universities delivering the talks. Definitely, it will uh, definitely motivate you to go for maybe for your PhDs or the postdoc to reach the bigger labs to understand the concept, how they are working. Then you can able to see how the science been refined and how the science been delivered, the lecture been delivered. So those things definitely make you. Uh, sometimes you have a little bit difficulty in the ascent. So the ascent may be a little different. Mm -hmm. Online users, please mute your microphone. Online user, uh, online. Participants, please mute your microphone. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this have good opportunity that even though we some of you have difficulty in the uh, ascent in which you deliver, but uh, definitely at the end of the day, end of the lecture, uh, you I expect the students to interact because sometimes uh, some of the concept we may not you may not be able to understand the concept, so that time can pose some questions that will clarify your thoughts. So that is another thing. Uh, definitely, as a, from the Dean PGS, uh, PGS point of view, we expect the students has to interact. So that definitely will uh, enhance your learning capacity and also it will, the speaker will be so happy that if you have a few questions being posted. And uh, online participant, please uh, uh, put your questions in the chat box. Uh, by that, uh, the, the organizers, they can able to read the questions or the speaker they you can able to read question they you can answer the your questions so it i expect the more of interactive session after the after the presentation is over so with that uh, i really um, uh, thank our vice chancellor for making this kind of uh, public defense hall and uh, providing the very uh, very uh, good digital platform in uh, more and more uh, facilities been created a, uh, make a lecture halls looks like where you are walking, uh, watching the lectures in the Western University. So this way, the uh, this hall will serving the purpose and also uh, whatever the connections we are doing with all the other campus, not only the Madurai campus student, but also the other campus students doing the research uh, with related to seats and technology and also the related discipline, they can able to use this kind of lecture series. Another thing, the lecture which you, we are going to uh, talk understanding the seed behavior the population of individuals so nowadays the seed seed biology or seed behavior or seed uh, germination to uh, the many kind of um, seed related research gaining momentum in many of the public and private sectors seed industry so i think uh, the Behavior, understanding the seed behavior is more complex than understanding the human behavior. So the, there are many tools, many techniques we have to use to study the seed behavior. Definitely the seed sometime in dormant or sometime in sleeping. So you have to find the behavior. It's a very tough job. I hope the uh, today's speaker can make a concept so simple and make us to understand the how the seed behavior when it is a when it is in a population or individual, how it is going to uh, affect their seed health or the seed languidity or seed uh, germination pattern. Um, I am really wa eagerly waiting for hearing the lecture uh, from the Dr. Kent. Uh, thank you, thank you for providing me the opportunity to share some of the views. This elite audience. Thank you, Onandal. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, sir, for your enthusiastic special address. A guest speaker can inspire students to care about where their education can take them. They can influence the students to investigate, apply newfound knowledge, and follow a path of lifelong learning. With this, we extend our profound gratitude and pleasure in welcoming our beloved and most respected guest speaker, Dr. Ken J. Bradford, Department of Plant Sciences, University of California, Davis, USA, to import knowledge and insights on topic Understanding Seed Behavior Population of Individuals. Now the session is over to guest speaker, Dr. Ken J. Bradford. Okay, let me share my screen. Let's see. Uh, 
Twenty centimeter shear. Tire screen. Has that worked? Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's my great pleasure to be. I thank uh, Dr. Manamani for inviting me and uh, and the warm welcome that I've uh, I've heard already. It's a great privilege for me to be here and uh, uh, make this presentation to you. I will try to leave a little bit of time at the end. So as was mentioned, if you have questions, uh, you can write them in the questions and the, the organizers will, uh, will help us uh, discuss them. So what I'm gonna try to do in, in this, uh, this time that I have is uh, introduce somewhat, what may be a new topic to some of you, but if you've worked with seeds, you probably will more and more recognize what I'm talking about. That is that seeds uh, behave as populations and as we want to understand them, we need to be thinking in those terms. So I'm gonna try to, uh, to go through that. Here's an overview of what I'm gonna try to do is, is talk a bit about uh, the traits that we're interested in, that is uh, evolved traits versus domesticated traits, uh, the population-based features in seed biology, a bit about our population-based threshold models. So this is an approach to describe germination rates and percentages so that we can quantify the way seeds behave. Uh, some experimental and technological implications about this and then some applications. That is, why would we be interested in doing this and show you some new technologies that are based somewhat upon this approach. And then I hope we can have some discussion about this. So in general, Seeds are not synchronous. That is, seeds uh, inherently uh, seem to <clears throat> be individuals and do their own thing. And this is partly because of, of, the, of what their purpose is. So as so we know, when seeds are uh, developing, then they often will have a primary dormancy. And this dormancy will require various uh, conditions to break it. That is, they will not germinate until they receive the right conditions of light, temperature, after ripening, chilling, whatever. So that then when they're not dormant, now they have the opportunity when the conditions are correct at that point to go ahead and germinate. But if they lose this initial dormancy, but then uh, go through some other types of conditions that is pass through one season, they didn't germinate that season, they're into the next season, then they can go into a relative dormancy or a second dormancy and back. Why do all this? What's the point of all this uh, for seeds? Well, the key to dormancy for seeds is their whole purpose. That is in the wild, the whole point is for plants to shed their seeds and then be ready to take advantage of various different conditions. Number one, survive through bad conditions. Number two, uh, be able to take advantage of the correct conditions in order to germinate and try to have the best survival of their seedlings. So it's a very important trait in the wild and has led to very complex uh, dormancy uh, mechanisms. Another point that <clears throat> we have to deal with sometimes when we're dealing with seeds, I'll just mention that we'll come back to this, that dormancy is often what we don't want <laughs> in, in terms of uh, when we're working with seeds, we want them all to germinate uh, when they're ready. The same with the shattering trait where when seeds are mature, they tend to shed. That is, they either fall off the plant or they make themselves available to, uh, to animals or birds or something to take them. But again, we generally want the seeds to stay on the plant until we harvest it. So once we start harvesting seeds, we want a very different set of traits. And dispersal, so we're gonna take care of that. So we just assume the plants did not disperse their seeds, but hung onto them and uh, allow us to harvest them and keep them. So these are three major traits that are uh, integral, essential to the function of wild uh, seeds, seeds in the wild and e ecologically speaking, but are negative in terms of agriculture. So these traits were strongly selected against during the domestication of crops. So as soon as people started harvesting crops, harvesting seeds, storing them and then replanting them, it became a very strong selection against these traits. Seeds that were either dormant or they did not stay on the plants or that got dispersed, didn't get carried over to the next season, therefore didn't get planted, therefore were selected against. So very strong selection in many of our crops. However, in many cases in our horticultural crops, we still have some of these traits happening. So we do, have not completed the domestication process in all of our crops. So we have a, a range from 
uh, very domesticated crops, uh, rice, wheat, uh, crops like this, to some that are barely domesticated, like some of our flower crops and horticultural crops and so on. So the fact that there is variation among the seeds is the normal state. And we are, in general, trying to reduce that and create uniformity in our seeds. This is just one example. This is carrot, uh, carrot plants uh, flowering, producing seeds. Plants look like this and have many layers in, of uh, umbels, that is primary umbels, secondary, tertiary, and so on. At any one time, they can have a whole array of developmental stages, developing flowers, flowers opening, uh, seeds forming, pollination, and so on, mature seeds, seeds that are already falling off the plant. So we have shattering going on. In fact, these are some pictures of the embryos from some of these seeds, all of which are, are viable, uh, but show the, shows the range of variation you can get by just harvesting all this together. These seeds, uh, these embryos are desiccation tolerant, they will germinate, but this little one will have to grow to this size before it even completes germination. <laughs> and so very wide range of, of features. This is just showing how the different umbels develop. So here's one reason that we have a lot of variation in some of our crops, just the way the plant morphology creates the seeds. <clears throat> Differences in maturity also happen in crops like these. These are brassica crops, for example, like uh, rapeseed and, and mustard and so on, where there's continuous flowering up a, a flowering stalk and you can have still fresh flowers at the top and you can have mature seeds at the bottom. And uh, one thing that has been discovered, and I'll, I'll show this example with rice, I'll come back to it later, but we can't see this very much, but it turns out that if you look at chlorophyll and you look at chlorophyll fluorescence, you can see very nicely seeds that still have the most chlorophyll. So these lighter colored seeds here are greener, which means they are less mature, which in general will mean that they're not as good. They have not developed as much quality as others. This is shown here. This is actually with brassicas, but it's showing that seeds that have high chlorophyll that in, during aging will die much quicker than the seeds that have low chlorophyll or much more mature. So this is a very simple <clears throat> way, and I'll show you again later how we can use this. I want to talk about populations, and I've titled my talk about understanding seed behavior, that we're looking at populations of individuals. So I'm sure many of you deal with statistics and so on, and you know about a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, there's a mean, and uh, the nice thing about a Gaussian distribution is that no matter how spread out it is or how narrow, there's certain fractions that are within a certain distance of the mean or a certain distance of the edges. So if this uh, standard deviation, this is the standard deviation of this curve, if we use standard deviation units, then we can say that one standard deviation away from the mean on either side encompasses 34% of the population. So with one standard deviation on both sides, we have 68% of the population. If we go another standard deviation, we get another 14% of the population. So Within two standard deviations, we have about 96% of the total population. Within three standard deviations, we have essentially everything. So what it means as well is that uh, this is really the mean of the population, but it, it, it also distributes all the way into these other regions, higher and lower. So this is a, <clears throat> a quote from a book about uh, rationality, Stephen Pinker's book last year. And he says, bell curves, which is what these are, the bell curves are common in the world. They arise whenever a measurement is the sum of a large number of small causes, like many genes together and many environmental influences. Well, that sounds a lot like seeds to me. <laughs> they have, may, may have 50,000 genes in them, of which maybe 10 or 20,000 are being expressed at a given time, and they're paying attention to the environment, which is having its own effects. So it's a very complex system. When you have that, things tend to happen in this normal distribution. That is, things that are more common under those conditions will be in the middle. Those that are more rare are on the outside. So in his book, he gives this example that we can think about throwing dice. If we have dice that go from one to six on the different sides, we can make two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We can make those numbers out of these dice. But there's only one way to make a 12. There's only one way to make a two. But there's two ways to make three and 11. There's four ways to make four and 10. And there's, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's three ways each. There's four ways to make five and nine, five ways to make seven. And then there's six ways, I mean, six ways to make a seven in the middle. So basically just because of the random 
combinations that are possible, you get more opportunities in the middle. So if you do this enough, you end up with a normal distribution. So the lower frequency events are on the ends and the higher frequency or more common events are in the middle. So this is what he's saying is that when you have, in, if we, instead of having only two dice and six sides, if we had thousands of genes and we had many inputs, this probability curve would tend to look more like a normal distribution. And I'll just say today, I'm not really talking about error. We tend to deal with these distributions a lot in doing statistics and thinking about what the error terms are, but I'm not worried about error. These are real things that are happening. That is, if you throw the dice, these things will happen and that's not error. It's just probabilities. It's just what's more likely than others. <clears throat> but each of these is real and we'll see that the same as it is true with seeds. So I'm not really worrying about the means or confidence intervals. I'm giving credit to all of these. Each one of these is an individual, each one has meaning. Okay. And <clears throat> this is very evident when we're going to breeding. If we talk to breeders and breeders look at this distribution, they have, they have different thoughts. In the middle are the most common genetic combinations. So breeders are interested in how genes recombine, what kind of traits are carried among different individuals and so on. The most common ones are in the middle. More rare ones are these out in these uh, several standard deviations away from the mean. So we have one, maybe on one side, we have rare favorable combinations and on the other side, rare unfavorable combinations. Breeders are very interested in these. They're very interested in finding these combinations of genes that give big gains in the traits that they want. Closer into the, toward the mean, we have QTLs. And again, some will be negative and some will be positive. They're not so strong that they dominate, that they're, they're <clears throat> but they're strong enough to be discovered. That is, there's enough impact of those traits that we can find those as quantitative trait loci, we call them. We can incorporate those traits and we can move forward in our breeding. <clears throat> so again, this population distribution is very common in breeding and they often will, uh, in other words, when you do breeding and you combine traits, very often we get normal distributions of trait properties. And so they're very, uh, very familiar Kent. with that. Yes. Dr. Kent, your, your slides not shared. Yeah, I'm sorry? Your slides. Yeah, your PPT not shared. Slides, slides. Slides not shared, sir. The slides not being shown? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm seeing it. Let's see if I can. Uh... Okay, the slides are gone. Let me try again. Is it back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> I can't tell the difference from this side. It looked like it was still working. I appreciate that. Okay, maybe I, okay. I think what happened is there's a little thing on my screen that I needed to get rid of. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's what can happen uh, there. Now let's think about a seed biology. If we have this distribution, what does that mean? Well, in general, it's gonna mean that we have a distribution of quality in terms of what we're interested in today. We have some highest quality seeds will be out in this part of the distribution, the lowest quality over here. These will be worse than average. These will be better than average. Most of them will be in the middle. So when we think in terms of means, that's not the best. In other words, the mean is the average. <laughs> it's the middle seeds. The bulk of the seeds are in the middle, that's fine, but we'd really rather have the best ones and we'd rather get rid of the, the poor ones if we possibly can. So <clears throat> when we think about seeds, we have to be thinking about where do they stand in this population? What do we wanna do with them and how can we enhance them, push them more toward the good quality side? We do a lot of uh, thinking of these terms in terms of statistics, for example, and comparing between seed lots. Often we're saying, okay, is a, if a seed lot is 98%, is that really different from 95 or is it different from 90? So and there's a use for that. That's not really what I'm, I'm worrying about today. My point is that basically this is the structure of seed populations. That is every time we have a seed lot, this is what we have. We have a whole range of, of types of seeds in there, a whole population that we're dealing with. And so that has to determine how we deal with it. So this is not my idea. This goes back, I'm gonna give a lot of credit to Eric Roberts, who was a professor in, uh, in the UK and in, in England. And this is, he was actually working in, in, uh, in India when he was working with dormant, with rice seed. And so he worked on dormancy of rice seed. And when the seeds were harvested, none of them would germinate, they were dormant. And then they were stored and after ripened for 12 weeks. 
and they tested germination every week. And this is the pattern he got, a very nice sigmoid curve here. And he pointed out that <clears throat> the curve he's drawn is calculated on the assumption that they represent a cumulative normal frequency distribution. So if we look at the normal distribution we showed a while ago, but instead of just going up, we just keep accumulating the total, then we get this nice sigmoid distribution. So he pointed this out back in uh, 1961, 60, <coughs> 61, 62 years ago. <laughs> and many of you may be familiar with the Ellis and Roberts equation. If you do deal with seed aging, uh, Richard Ellis and, and Eric Roberts, who I just mentioned, uh, developed a model for seed longevity. And again, it shows that as seeds start to die, if, we're, if we have them under, in this case, very difficult con conditions, because it's a period of days, but this could be months or years even, when they start to die, they show this same normal distribution. So there's a normal distribution of deaths over time. There's a few here, there's a lot in the middle, there's a very few more here. So we have a nice normal distribution of, of deaths or a sigmoid curve. From that, they developed an entire uh, <clears throat> storage model and, and, and viability model, which said that the viability after some period of time P was equal to a starting point and a slope divided one over the standard deviation. So if you plot this on a standard deviation scale, which is called a probit scale, then you can plot the, you could plot those data it would turn into a straight line and you could get the slope would be the standard deviation. So it's, uh, it may be hard for the students to, uh, to believe it, but uh, all of this was done before we had computers. So it was very, very nice to be able to make a straight line out of something and you could do easy calculations. But you can see how you're converting standard deviations, you have to squeeze the percentages in the middle and, and stretch them at the end. But we won't deal with <clears throat> much more with that. But just to say this has become a very common way to quantify seed longevity is using this Ellis Roberts model. So one of the implications <clears throat> if we do this is we have to, if we start thinking about it, if that's the case, then we ought to be able to measure differences among individual seeds. So quite a while ago, we did some single seed assays. That is, we were working with a, an enzyme that we knew was involved in germination of, of tomato seeds. And uh, we could assay for this enzyme, as it's shown here, this is a standard curve at the bottom. If we put known amounts of this enzyme in these little wells, let it diffuse out into this, this medium and then stain it, we could see how much enzyme there was. So very little enzyme all the way up to a lot of enzyme. And these are individual seeds. So we were taking just little bits, just the endosperm cap in front of the radical, which is the place where this, it, it, this is the barrier to seed germination. We would take those little bits of tissue and we would measure them individually. And here's what we got. That is, here's the germination time course down here. And this is the amount of this uh, mannanase enzyme that's being made. And the first thing you notice is that it's, it's a log scale. It goes from 0.1 to 1,000. So there's a huge range among these seeds, okay, individual differences. If we look down here, these are ones that are very low, very low activity, 1, 0.1, so on. That turns out to be the, de the dormant seeds. <laughs> that is, those seeds never germinated because they're still present at the end. Once the seed germinated, we didn't measure it again. So basically, these very low ones, they didn't germinate. That's because this enzyme is, is involved in germination. The other seeds <clears throat> at the very top, these are the ones that germinated and you can see have very, very high levels. Okay, and you can, this is the fraction of seeds having high levels. So here we've got 30% of the seeds with a value of 100 compared to these having one. So we have really very high levels. We go to about in the middle somewhere, this point here, they're clearly differentiated into two groups. That is, we have the dormant ones that are not going to germinate, and we have the ones that are germinating. What we tend to do a lot of times in seed biology is we just take all these seeds and we grind them up together, and we take that as the average. We say, well, that's, that's close enough. It's not really when you have this sort of situation where you have very extreme differences. For example, in this case, only three seeds out of 45 measured accounted for 93% of the total activity <laughs> because they're a hundred or a thousand times greater than those that don't make any. In other words, it would take a hundred seeds at this level to make just one of those. So this was very convincing to us that we need to be start thinking in biological terms about these variations and these differences among seeds. I'll just jump way ahead now. That was, <clears throat> geez, 30 years ago when we did that. 
this is a brand new paper just from last year, where now, instead of just measuring an enzyme, these people are taking one whole seed. This is an Arabidopsis seed, very tiny seed, crushing that seed and measuring all the transcripts, that is, sequencing all the transcripts that are being made in that seed. So they're, they're looking at, at thousands of seeds here. And they're grouping these. And so basically what they're showing is that as these seeds are starting to, to be imbibed and start to germinate, they're making a lot of different, transcribing a lot of different genes. They then put them under conditions where they're gonna go dormant. So they put them under warm temperatures and they push them into dormancy. All the seeds become very uniform and they stop doing anything. So they can follow this in the transcriptome. They can say they're starting to germinate, but now they're gonna turn around and go back and they're gonna become dormant. If we take them out of that condition, this is high temperature that they're putting them in. If we take them out of that, move them, uh, let them recover, now they start germinating again and we get a huge variation again in the transcript. So basically we can do this gene by gene across entire <clears throat> organisms now. So this is basically what's, what's happening is that you have a lot of genes down here that are uh, more associated with uh, survival and uh, desiccation and things like that that come from development. We have other genes that are being synthesized in preparation for germination. And what they're pointing out here is that if we put them under dormancy inducing conditions, they start here where most of them are not dormant, we end up over here where they are dormant. And basically, again, we see a population of seeds and as <clears throat> we're moving across this, that is we're getting more and more signal to become dormant, more and more of the seeds become dormant. So basically there's differences in their susceptibility to this, eventually they all will become dormant. So here is under dormancy inducing conditions, in this case, high inhibition temperatures, the thresholds of increasing numbers of seeds are exceeded. That is more and more of them are going, oh, it's too hot, I'm gonna go dormant. This triggers a reduction in the expression of germination related genes and increasing numbers of dormant seeds. The same pattern would occur really if we were releasing dormancy. That is if they were all dormant and now we were giving them a dormancy breaking treatment, we'd see just the reverse. They would be moving from dormancy back to germination in response to some dormancy breaking treatment like after ripening or chilling or whatever. But again, whether a seed is dormant or not is an individual thing. A given seed either germinates or it doesn't. It can't kind of half try. It either is germinated or it's not. So everything happening with seeds is what we call quantal or digital in a sense. <clears throat> and each one is paying attention to its own signals and deciding, am I going to go or am I not going to go? Here's another way that another type of experiment that convinced us we need to think this way. This experiment where we took tomato seeds that were deficient in gibberellins gibberellins are required for germination uh, and they're very strong promoters of germination. If you take seeds that cannot make their own, their own gibberellin, they can't germinate at all. They're way down here at the bottom and they can't germinate. If we give them some gibberellin, 0.1, 1, 10, 100 micromolar, you see what happens. That is more and more seeds can germinate. They become faster. But if we're at a certain level, say we're at 10, they don't all eventually germinate. You reach a plateau and then they just quit. What that means is that this fraction, say 70%, was sensitive to 10 micromolar gibberellin, but the rest of these needed more, okay? So again, we can fractionate this population with gibberellin sensitivity. So that's what I'm showing here. We have a normal distribution of sensitivity now. We have different hormone levels. So when we give a low level, this fraction of the seed population are the only ones that respond these down here. If we give more gibberellin, we recruit more seeds. Okay, so we're recruiting more seeds to germinate as we give them more hormone. And they also become faster. So this seed that at a low concentration took this long to germinate becomes much faster. So there's two effects that are happening when we give factors that affect germination. There's an effect on whether they germinate or not. There's an effect on how fast they are. So we have both of the effects visible here. Higher levels, we recruit more all of the seeds then become even faster all the way up to here. In fact, we would have had to go a little bit higher. Our prediction, we'd have to go out to one millimolar in order to get the last little bit of seeds to germinate. So that is an example of how this population distribution of sensitivities interacts with a signal like gibberellin. We can recruit more seeds and we can also speed them up.
So <clears throat> this is that basic model. So we, this is all the math we're going to need. It's basically that there's a constant. This is equal to the factor, gibber And in this case, the difference between that factor and the threshold of an individual seed. So this symbol says x sub b of i. So this is a normal, this is my normal distribution of thresholds. And this is the time to germination. So what it's saying is that if this difference is really big, the time has to be small because this is a constant. And as this factor gets closer and closer to this threshold, the time gets longer and longer and longer. It's a very simple inverse relationship. So this is the time constant for a certain factor. It can be x, y, we'll go with, come back to that. This is the factor level. This is the sensitivity threshold distribution. And that's the time at which something happens, okay? So just to show you how this works, here's our distribution. This is water potential, for example, it's getting drier in this direction, wetter in this direction. So if we're in pure water, the, simple, the, thing, the level is all the way out here. This would be pure water right out here when this bar hits here. You can see that's the fastest germination, no ping, as fast as it could go. As the water potential goes down, this is the series of curves that we would predict. And this is actually what happens. Much greater effect on these over here than down here. You see, it doesn't, it, they slow down maybe twice as long or so. Here, it takes much longer or they're completely inhibited. Once this factor level hits the population, then they start not germinating at all. So basically this is how many, many things, I'll show you a list in a little bit of the way many things, hormones, temperature, water potential, <clears throat> work in seed germination. If we wanna quantify this, if we collect germination time courses at several factor levels, we can, recreate, we can plot this, we can figure this out and we can quantify it. So we can characterize this by a mean and a standard deviation and a time constant, and we've got everything we need to know to generate all these curves. We understand what the seeds will do when they encounter a certain situation. So I know this is a little bit much to, to try to understand. I'm gonna give you another example. We've created another little model. So this is strictly an analogy, <laughs> but it's to trying to get you to get a mental picture of how this, how this works. This is what we call the, uh, the rolling ball analogy, <laughs> okay? So what this is gonna do, this movie is gonna say, let's imagine that a ball is rolling down a hill and it has to grow up over a second hill. So this we're gonna call our threshold. Over here, this is gonna represent the factor level that I just mentioned. This could be gibberellin or water or whatever. If it starts higher, as you might expect, it's gonna roll further. Okay, it can roll further down the way. Hope you're still there, yeah. <clears throat> if it starts lower, it barely gets over. It's, if it's at the threshold, it can't germinate at all. So it's stopped, okay? So they have no response. So that's what I said. If you're below the threshold, you don't give a response. With a promotive factor, <clears throat> the speed depends upon this difference. So here's our threshold level. Here's our factor level. It will roll a certain distance after going over the threshold. If we increase the factor, it's as if we started higher and now we'll go faster. This is time going this way or speed going this way. Same with an inhibitor, inhibitory factor, but we just flip the scale around. So now when we have an inhibitory factor, we're increasing as we go down. Here we have relatively little of an inhibitory factor. It germinates quite well, it goes fast. If we add more inhibitory factor, it's gonna slow down. If we add too much, <clears throat> it won't be able to germinate at all. So these are the ones that can't germinate. These are the ones that can. Oop, sorry. I jumped too far there. Let me get it back and I'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, I don't know if I can speed it up. Well, <clears throat> we'll just have to watch this again because I hit, a, hit the wrong button. <clears throat> I don't know how to make it go fast. So again, we're, we're, what we're trying to do here is try to create a model in your mind that says the higher the factor is that is promoting germination, the faster it's gonna go. So that's basically your, or if the factor is too low, it won't get over the, <clears throat> it won't go over the threshold at all and to be inhibited. And what this is representing is the difference among all these different seeds. Okay, okay so as I said, a pro promotive factor acts this way. That is, if we take the difference between the threshold and the factor, it's gonna give us a certain speed. And if we increase that factor, now we have <clears throat> more promoter, if you will, 
it's going to go faster. Again, this is the germination rate. This is the inverse of time. Time is getting increasing in this direction. The same thing happens with an inhibitory factor, as I said, except we just reverse it. Now, as we increase the inhibitory factor, they go slower until they just can't germinate at all. Now we'll be back to where we were. Whoop, can't make it. Now the other factors that are that are involved here <clears throat> are the um, again we've got the factor we had that we have to get over the threshold and that's where we have the distribution as I'll show you in a minute and the less of this inhibitor we have the faster it's going to go. This is where the time constant comes in. So if we have a uh, increase the size of the time constant then that makes everything go slower. Whereas if we have a short time constant, it all goes fast. So it affects all the seed, no matter where they're starting, they're all gonna speed up or slow down if we change the time constant. So basically that's just <clears throat> changing the everything, regardless of the factor level, everything will either speed up or slow down. The key factor that we'll talk about quite a bit though is that these thresholds so far have all looked the same, but they're not. This is this distribution of thresholds that we have. So if we have different things starting way up here, they're gonna go to different levels. This one has to go start very high, but it can't overcome this high threshold. This one can overcome that threshold, but it'll go further. And here, if it goes over that one, it'll go further. So these are the fastest seeds slower seeds, slower seeds, but they will still germinate because they can get over the threshold. And these are normally, usually in a normal distribution. That is these thresholds are not identical. That's where the variation comes in. So back to this, this is what I was trying to explain. This is the time constant. This is the factor level. This is the threshold distribution and this is the time. So it's very simple. But we've shown that this works for all these different things. So anything you want to know about seeds, almost this simple model will describe its germination in response to that. Temperature, water potential, ABA is an inhibitor, GA is a promoter, oxygen, light, a priming treatment that will speed germination, seed longevity, as I said, dormancy, flowering, respiration, and so on. So many, many things will fit this model. That's why we're, why we're interested in it. <clears throat> so look back again, how are we gonna apply this a little bit? So this is showing the development of quality in, in seed during development. Usually the seeds initially had developed their germination capacity. So they may not be desiccation tolerant. That is, if you take them right out of the plant, you put them on water, they may be able to germinate, but then they have to develop some more before they become desiccation tolerant so that you can dry them and then they will germinate. Usually it takes a bit longer for them to develop vigor, which for me means speed. That is, they, they will be able to germinate, but it takes a long time. So if you let them get more mature, then they'll go faster. And the storage life is the last thing. That is at the end of development, then they increase in their storage life. And if you let them go to their optimum uh, maturity, then they're gonna have the longest storage life, plus high germination, plus high vigor. Here's some data showing that from, uh, from some work on Medicago. Uh, showing here's the dry weight accumulation. As it accumulates, the water content go, goes down. Oop, I don't have any symbols on there. Desiccation tolerance comes up. So in other words, if you dried the seeds at these different times after a certain point, they're desiccation tolerant. Here's the time to germination down here. So it, don't worry about this too much, but once they become desiccation tolerant, they're pretty slow to germinate, but then they get faster and faster. This is shorter and shorter time. So they get faster and faster. So that's an indication of vigor. And the longevity goes up toward the end of development as well. This has been looked at now in terms of genes and, and development, embryogenesis, desiccation tolerance, uh, seed storage, material filling, so on, germination. All of these things have their characteristic gene expression patterns, <clears throat> as it showed here. So these connections show that they're grouped and there's a whole group of genes, for example, involved in that desiccation tolerance trait. There's genes involved in the, the dry weight accumulation, the seed filling and so on. So there's this final maturation and so on is preparing for uh, drying and, and all that. So these have all been done and there's been data for uh, tomato seeds as well. So 
once we have the seeds, here's another way that we can apply this, this, uh, this concept of populations is that we have a, uh, uh, if we're storing seeds, they will store for quite a while at pretty high level of viability, let's say. But then we have this drop off, as we saw earlier, it's, an, it's a sigmoid curve where they're going to start uh, falling off. And the actual viability, they, they won't do anything, is this curve over here that they can't even do a radical. So if they can't push out a radical, they're fully dead. So this red curve is the accumulation of dead seeds as these that can't make a radical come out. Before that is actually the curve where they can make normal seedlings. And so if you pass that threshold, this if you're storing the seeds, you pass that threshold, you may have a period here where they can make abnormal seedlings and then they die. So this is sort of the, the basis of the Ellis Roberts model I mentioned earlier. So how, this is how it fits with our model. It says that we have a, an aging constant. We have a distribution here, which is this one over here. This is this distribution of death times, if you will. See, some seeds can last a lot longer than others. So these last a lot longer than those initial ones that die. And this is the storage time. And we can translate that actually to time to germination. So in other words, each of these time points along here, we can have a germination time. So that's what we're showing here. If we have a, this is this distribution. We took the sigmoid curve. We made it into this nice distribution. This is the maximum longevity of a given seed. So as storage time is increasing, we're getting closer and closer to this. And what we're gonna see is a whole pattern of germination curves. So when we have a lot of storage time left, we're way out here at A, we have fast germination, they look nice and vigorous. As we get closer and closer to the, this curve, they slow down, but they can still all germinate. But once we start getting into this population, now a certain fraction can't germinate and they're all gonna be slow. So what this is really telling you, all of these <clears throat> things we talked about, all these things that this model works for, the germination percentage and the rates are connected. That is, they're connected with each other in that you can have a delay, you can have a slowing down, a loss of vigor, if you will, but still high viability. But eventually those all start to go down. So you very seldom have 50% germination, but really fast. So this is what we're, we're learning about. All of these traits are connected with each other. And what this says is that if you wanted to predict how long your seeds would last under storage, say you have a known given storage condition, you could take seed lots and you could apply some controlled aging tests and you could determine their relative viability. That is, if you standardize a controlled aging test yourself and then followed those seeds later under your storage conditions, you could calibrate a test that would predict pretty well how long those seeds are going to last in your storage. The other thing that this model predicted, I won't go into it, but it basically will predict that, go back up for a minute, given the fact that there is generally an offset between this normal seedling curve and this radical emergence curve. That is, they're usually offset. Some can be a long ways. Soybeans, for example, you have a lot of abnormal seedlings and there's a big spread. Some other seeds, lettuce, for example, this is usually very close. There's, most of the seeds are either do or don't germinate, not that many abnormals. It says what, I, what our model predicts, however, is that after a certain time point in this delay, once these seeds are delayed, the remaining seeds will probably be abnormal. <laughs> Seed testers do a lot of work to learn how to score abnormal seedlings and do a lot of scoring of abnormal seedlings. When in fact, for a given species, you could probably calibrate that and say, well, if it hasn't germinated by a certain point, it probably isn't gonna be very good. <laughs> and so <clears throat> the faster it is, the more vigorous, and at a certain point, it probably isn't. So we might rethink a little bit about how we do uh, seed testing based upon this approach. I'm gonna go on now and tell you a little bit about some more modern uh, technologies that, that apply here. How are we gonna do this? If we really wanna know what every seed's doing, what are we gonna do? It's very tedious to go and look at them every few hours. I have graduate students that have done that, get really nice data, but it's not very practical. Certainly not on a large scale. It's too tedious, too, too labor intensive. So we've worked with how can we assess individual seed quality in a way that's, that's more robotic, if you will, uh, but gives us good data. So we've, been working with this instrument. We, it was formerly called the Q2, but it's a, it's a respiration measurement. It can measure individual seed respiration. So we can put seeds into these wells, put them on agar, seal the top then with, <clears throat> with a, a, a sealant that has a little dye on the top. So it has this little pad of dye. 
that will fluoresce in response to this light. So this little meter, let me go back one, this little thing here is movable. It moves over, it moves over the top of every little well, it shines a light on it. It measures the fluorescence back. The fluorescence is dependent upon the oxygen level inside the well. So as the seeds respire and use up the, ox use up the oxygen, we get a different signal. So basically we can follow the pattern of respiration seed by seed over the time of a seed starting to germinate. So initially they're germinating at a, I mean, they're respiring at a relatively slow rate. At a certain point, each seed will start to germinate and then it will respire much more quickly. So we can follow this pattern and then they end up using up all the oxygen and, and it's over. So in a, in, a, in a time course, we can follow the seeds through this. We can collect their respiration data. So this is what I'm showing <clears throat> here. This is for a series where we have these, uh, have some ABA deficient seeds. These seeds don't have any ABA and you see they will germinate or they, they will respire very quickly and uniformly. All of these seeds are respiring, using up their oxygen very uniformly and quickly. But if we give them a little bit of ABA, look what happens. Now, we have a few seeds that just ignored it. We have a few seeds that are completely inhibited and we have a complete spectrum of seeds doing different things. So this shows directly that every seed has its own sensitivity to that single concentration. If we add more hormone, more of them are inhibited. That's the black lines here, but a few of them are still germinating almost as fast as they were originally. And it takes a quite a high concentration until all of them at well, one are inhibited. So this is a very, hardy seed here, very low, low sensitivity to ABA. So again, we can see that <clears throat> directly that there's a sensitivity distribution among the seeds. The other thing you can see here, if you follow this dotted curve, this is actually the average of all of these curves in terms of how the overall population use the oxygen. This is what we'd get if we put all the seeds together in one tube and we just measured the air above those seeds. We'd say, okay, here's how the oxygen is going down in these 50 seeds. What I point out is not a single seed does that, right? <laughs> Every seed has, it reaches a certain point and respires very quickly, germinates almost immediately. So these averages are not really reflecting reality. They may be useful if you just need to know what the whole population is doing. But if we're trying to go for mechanism where we're trying to understand the difference among these seeds, this mean is not gonna help us at all. Here's the same data is just showing that if we actually went in and measured germination at these different ABA concentrations, since it inhibits germination, we get a whole series of curves. The data are the points and our, our model is these lines. This is if we use the respiration data. So we can get pretty much identical curves from the respiration data <clears throat> and from the uh, germination data that's shown here. So for temperature, water potential, inhibitors, ABA, GA, and so on, almost perfect relationships between germination timing and respiration timing. So we can use respiration as a substitute for measuring germination. So this is showing here a few ways that that's, <clears throat> this would, for example, be controlled deterioration. This is where aging these seeds, these are actual time points, data points that we've measured. And this is the respiration data. So both of them can be, show very nicely the pattern. They don't give you identical time courses, but they give you the same pattern. Here's for same thing for lettuce and with the amount of data we had, the, the model seemed like it fits pretty good. And here it fits fairly well. What you can see is that it's not fitting perfectly. You see there's some, some problems here. What actually we determined is that in fact, what we have is a mixed seed lot. We have one seed lot that has one set of properties. We have another seed lot that has a different set of properties. So in fact, what we have is two sets of seed lots. This might've been a blended seed lot, for example and they're behaving a little bit differently. We can actually detect that with our model. We can actually, sh these lines drawn on here are just the sum of these two curves and saying, predict what's gonna happen. This is where we go back to the germination with this double model. Now we can fit the, the curves better. And you can see that, yeah, this would have looked fine. Now we know what it is, it looks even better. <laughs> so in other words, we can pick apart seed lots now <clears throat> with this seed by seed measurements and understand really what's going into making their patterns behave as they do. What we really are trying to get to is to be able to sort seeds so that we can sort out the bad ones and keep only the good ones. This would be the ideal. We do a lot of seed cleaning, screening, and so on. We're, that's what we're always trying to do. We're trying to clean out the trash, clean out the, the poor seeds, and so on. So we do a lot of cleaning of seeds. 
based upon their physical properties, that is the size, shape, and so on. In fact, there are instruments, there have been machines now for 10 years or 15 years that will actually x-ray seeds. You can take x-rays, you can actually see the embryo and they have actually trained <clears throat> computers to look at these seeds, look at their, you may have to prime them because it makes the embryo show up really well. But they have a system where the seeds will go around, they will be individually x-rayed, they will be scored by the computer and they come back around and they will keep the good ones and get rid of the bad ones. That is, they have learned that when the embryo isn't formed properly, it won't make a normal seedling and they can just get rid of it. So this, there are seed companies that, that do this routinely <clears throat> in Europe, at least, in sorting these seeds. There's other types of technologies we can apply. <clears throat> Imaging technologies, for example. This is a, an instrument called the video meter, and it can take images in 19 different wavelengths. There are little LEDs around the top of this that shine light in here. You put a seed under here, close this lid, and then you can get images across a whole bunch of wavelengths. Well, what good is that? Well, here's some tomato seeds and we can image that and we can easily detect the tomato seeds, which are the orange ones from these other seeds or dirt or whatever this is, these blue ones. So you can find the, the reflectance wavelengths of what you're looking at and can very easily separate them. This is showing some squash seeds. You can't really see anything here, but if you put them under certain types of wavelengths then these cracks, so on, for example, show up very clearly. You can also use it, for example, to say, if you're treating seeds with a, uh, a coating or something, can you can quantify that. That is, you can put them through and you can quantify the amount that you can see here with this instrument. So you can actually see, am I getting on the seed what I think I <clears throat> am? And I mentioned the chlorophyll level earlier. So we said the chlorophyll level goes high early in seed development and usually goes down, even in seeds that don't look all that green. But it's a nice indication of maturity. And as I showed you earlier, you can pick out in the immature seeds just with, you can use it with this machine, excuse me, or a different machine that specifically looks at chlorophyll fluorescence. So there are ways now to take seed lots that you can't separate by uh, physical means and further separate them into higher quality lots. I'm gonna try to run this now, see if this will. <clears throat> no, I think I'll, I'll skip that. It doesn't look like that's. No, it doesn't look like that's going to run. This is just to show you that you can do this on a very large scale. You, as I showed you for the uh, x-ray machine, you can do this on quite a large scale. Here's an, another way that this can be done. That is, this instrument that I just showed you can take images. And from those, you can train it then what you want it to look for. <clears throat> and it has sorting sorting instrument out here that will pick those and move them and sort them into different categories for you. This is not very fast, as you can see, it's maybe a few seeds a second, so it, uh, it has a way to go, but apparently the newer versions are now able to just have, <laughs> have this continuous flow and, and sort these seeds into different categories. We've used this actually, this is some work we've done uh, fairly recently where we've actually got a, sort of a seed quality pipeline, if you will. The issue was that certain brassicas, if they're imbibed under cold temperatures, will form blind plants, meaning they will not put out a shoot, the meristem dies or, or quits functioning. Instead of having multiple leaves and growing into a shoot, they have what's called blind plants. And of course, this is not good. <laughs> so they'd like to know, could we sort seeds that potentially would make be more susceptible to this from those that, are, that aren't? So we had seeds, we did a number of things. We measured their chlorophyll content. We put them into the multispectral imaging. We took pictures of them dry. Then we put them in the blindness induction. We imbibe them, chill them uh, for 48 hours, which induces uh, uh, this, this trait in susceptible seeds. Took another picture of them, put them in our respiration machine so we could see their respiration, see their germination. Pictures again. The reason we took a picture again is we trained the machine to score the seedlings so we can train the machine to score the seedling tissue and then we can get seedling size uh, automatically from these images. So we know for every seed what its seedling size is, which really is an indication of when it germinated. We can do all this, then we can put this in a, <clears throat> a uh, principal components analysis or various ways we can look at it. But basically we separated this into the more normal, the normal seedlings that are gonna be not susceptible 
line seedlings here in the middle, some dead seedlings that were killed by the treatment. So they're quite susceptible to the cold. And we can identify the factors that are associated with that. And here's chlorophyll level was quite associated with this quadrant over here where most of the susceptible seeds were. So basically it's saying that if we were to sort these seeds for chlorophyll fluorescence or chlorophyll, remove the immature seeds, most of the seeds that would be susceptible to this, <coughs> this, uh, this disorder would be removed. We're also working with another company from uh, Israel it's called SeedX. They are actually uh, founded by a, uh, a person who helped develop the initial face recognition technology. So I'm sure you've uh, used now face recognition where you know, go to an airport or something, they look at your face and they, they know who you are. <laughs> they said, why don't we try this for seeds? Just to see, could we sort them? If we knew the, the phenotype at the end, could we train it? Because these have artificial intelligence and so on. And actually that's what they're doing. They will image seed lots, plant them in order. So they keep track of them in order, phenotype them for the traits that they want. Then train their classifier. This is an artificial intelligence classifier that says, okay, here's what I saw. This was the outcome. Form a model that will tell me which are which. And basically they were able to do that. So this fraction that were predicted as germinating that actually did are the blue ones. And the ones predicted as non-germinating and actually did not are the non-germinating or the green ones. So it did pretty well. There's overlap, of course, but did pretty well in separating the germinating and non-germinating seeds based just upon the, the initial <coughs> pictures. And they actually have also built a, a sorting machine that uses this, uh, uh, their equipment to take pictures of a seed lot, train itself, and then be able to sort seeds one by one for various things. And they've used this already for certain uh, disorders of seeds to improve seed lots. So basically I'm gonna finish up here and have a little time for discussion. What are we gonna, you know, what can we do with this idea of seeds as individuals for seed technology? I think we're gonna see a lot more imaging. <laughs> this is, you know, seed by seed. It's not very high throughput, but in the field grains and seed corn, for example, in the US, they have very powerful Im uh, color, Im color sorters that can sort on multiple colors now. And it's very soon that they'll be able to use the information from a very complicated multispectral image like this and sort high volumes of seeds. So we use now mainly in high value seeds where you really wanna get uh, every seed to work, but it's possible that this will be adopted before too long. I think we're gonna see more of this automated seed quality testing, something where it's low labor, but you get a lot of information, you get seed quality information and you get predictive ability. All of this is gonna be enhanced by artificial intelligence. It's gonna get easier and easier to use this, all of this information to, <clears throat> improve the seed quality. As I mentioned, the sorting technology is gonna improve. We've got ones now that will do single seeds. They have X-ray machines now. We could add these color machines that will identify the seeds, kick them out. These are, are very high throughput machines now. And why would we wanna do that? Uh, here's a new planting technology that we're using in California. It's called paper tape. You make a continuous paper <clears throat> band, if you will, with planting material put a seed in each one and then water them and they should all grow. <laughs> that is, these are gonna be planted automatically by machine. And if there's not a seedling in there, there's a skip in the field. So there's very high demand on this. And in order for this to work, you have to have extremely high seed quality in order to get a whole greenhouse full of plants where everyone comes up as expected. So this is the way uh, high value markets are going. And they're gonna be using some of this technology to get seed lots that will perform at that level. For example, one of the major seed companies uh, providing tomato seeds in greenhouses in Europe tells me their standard, their threshold standard is one failure out of 200 seeds. In other words, out of 200 seeds, only one cannot germinate. That's sort of their quality standard now. So that's what we're aiming for, perfect seedlings. So I wanna just finish here with a quote from Eric Roberts who said, says it's been suggested that seeds are unpredictable things and consequently it would be a waste of time to try to perceive laws of behavior among such erratic individuals. But other disciplines have shown us quite clearly that although the behavior of any individual in a population may be quite un unpredictable, the behavior of populations of individuals can often be defined very accurately. So that's what we're aiming for here. Use the population characteristics to inform us about 
which seeds are which and which ones we want to keep. So that's the, uh, my, my story. I'm glad to talk to, to you with answer any of your questions I can. I want to give some credit to my colleague, Pedro Bello, who worked with me. He helped uh, uh, develop this, uh, this conceptual model in the, in the video that you saw and helped uh, try to show. I hope you understand now that we have the threshold here and we have the speed as well. So these are the ways that <clears throat> the two ways that these models are working. So with that, I'm going to hope that I can uh, stop sharing. Here we go. I can stop sharing that and uh, have a discussion with you. Thank you very much for having me, and I will look forward to uh, trying to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Brad, for your uh, very interesting talk. And, uh, I feel happy to hear your talk. I mean, uh, could answer many of my doubts. Actually, I am a rice breeder and involved in seed production for so long time. As you said, uh, the single seed derived population, I use uh, panicle derived population for my seed production. Still, I see some kind of variations like uh, the grain filling, the hardness. They are, they are genetically pure, true to type. Yeah. Still, I could see considerable uh, variation in the expression of seed rights. They are yeah. objectionable. I assume that they are due to abiotic stress or soil fertility. I mean, the transcriptomic levels, are they mediated by any ep epigenetic regulation in the seed? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I should have mentioned, uh, you know, as a breeder, uh, you know, I should have mentioned that nearly all that I was talking about was homozygous plants. In other words, this seed variation is happening in the inbred plants, so we're not looking at gen genetic variation very much. I mean, that's the, that's the curiosity. But, uh, you know, this is the point that, that seeds, even so, even though they're genetic identical, selfed in a uniform <laughs> inbred plant, the seed Hang variation on. is there. So I, it comes, I think, from this history of, one, the history of this dormancy, two, from, as you say, they're not identically placed even on the panicle or on a, on a ear of corn or anything. So you have differences uh, even within a panicle, for example, in some of these, uh, some of the way the development goes. Certainly epigenetics could be a big part of it. Uh, we also know that uh, the, the seeds during development are being influenced by the environment that the mother plant is in. So you know, you could have conditions where you have, you know, unfortunately high weather or, or a cold spell or something. And if the seeds are developing right at that time, they will have different traits than some in another field that didn't experience that temperature change and things like that. So this is all physiological variation. And it, it very likely comes from the, the fact that all of those responses, that response to environment and so on, had a, it had a, a survival value back when rice was growing out in the wild. <laughs> I mean, I have a colleague who works on dormancy in wild rice. It has very, very dormant. They can find QTLs for it. They've pinned genes for it and everything, as you probably know, but we've eliminated most of that. But I think we haven't eliminated everything. Those seeds are still paying attention to the environment. And as you say, depending on how they're grown, if they're ahead of each other, behind, you can still get quite a lot of performance variation or seed trait variation, even in something that's genetically uniform. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank I don't you. know if that really doesn't give you any real details, but I think that's what we know. Yeah, I'd like to have your point. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Multidisciplinary approach in research is a way forward. A huge thanks for your invaluable flat and cognizance in this topic and enlightening with the information and your experience in this field, sir. Definitely, your lecture will be a galvanizing factor in steering us into a new path or way of research. Now, now the session is open for discussion. Participants who are present both online and offline are requested to interact with our guest speaker. students, young faculties, both online and offline, you kindly interact with Dr. Kent. So, thank you, Kent. You were a mind-blowing lecture. It's very interesting. <laughs> I hope I didn't blow too many minds. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was not my intent, but it was my intent to show you a little bit different way very, to look at seeds. Very, very uh, nice. Know. 
I'm trying to convince you to put some different glasses on and see populations everywhere and individuals rather than means. <laughs> Yeah, my kind request to the students and faculties of uh, both the uh, all Tamil Nadu Agriculture University faculties, you please interact with Hello. Dr. Kent. Hello, Professor Kent. This is Satyashree from GKVK Bangalore. Uh, I hope you are doing fine and thanks for the wonderful lecture. So I had a question that this heterogeneity might be an advantageous trait in the wild, but I believe plans to adapt to domestication. But this percentage of heterogeneity is remaining even, even after the repeated attempts of domestication. What might be the possible evolutionary advantage of that trait remaining? Uh, I, I missed one thing. You, you, asked, yeah? you asked what the advantage of a particular trait in domestication, but I missed what the trait was. I'm sorry. Not particular trait, but the percentage of heterogeneity that is remaining even after repeated domestication. So even the domesticated lines will be adapted to evolution. No? So what might be the reason of that trait still means like that heterogeneity still remaining in the population? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's sort of a similar one as I was discussing with, the, with your colleague, the rice breeder there that We've done the best we can. I mean, we've got them uh, as uniform and we continue to try to get more and more uniformity into it. If we think about uh, wheat, for example, uh, we've eliminated the dormancy in wheat to the point that now, if it rains on them, they'd sprout on the plant. I mean, we have no dormancy left <laughs> to get them even uh, from, to not harvest, uh, pre-harvest sprout. So, you know, we've done what we can on some areas and we need to even back off a bit, but, uh, I really don't, I, I think one thing that we can do is we're learning more and more about the signals that come from the environment. We're learning more and more about the development. Uh, it could be that we can learn enough to know, okay, these are some of the sources, the, the, with some genes that are responsible for being too sensitive and therefore in, invoking uh, heterogeneity into the population. Maybe we turn off certain sensitivities so they don't pay attention to that anymore. They just, you know, they're immune to it. I really don't know how we're going to get. Uh, I mean, some some it's very simple. I mean, I work a lot with vegetables. I have very clear ideas what I think we should do. We should stop shattering. <laughs> For example, we have not completely stopped shattering, uh, and the plants once they're mature, the seeds start to fall off, while they still have immature seeds uh, and developing seeds on them. You know, we don't allow that in beans and things like that. I mean, we're just used to things staying on the plant most legumes in the wild explode and throw their seeds everywhere. So we, we've eliminated that. So uh, we need to, to push further on many of these, uh, these non-grain crops and eliminate shattering because then you can allow the seeds to go to maturity. That's why I started my talk with the idea that seed maturity is very critical. If we have shattering type crops, we can't let all the seeds go to maturity or half of them have already fallen off the plant and we've lost them. So I, I talk with breeders all the time who are working in, uh, in vegetable crops in brassicas, oils like uh, broccoli or cauliflower or, or mustard or oilseed rape. Stop shattering. It's very simple. It's one gene, one or two genes. Do a mutation <laughs> screen. Stop shattering so that the seed pods will stay intact. And then you can allow the seed to go to much more maturity and retain those good seeds and then you will have not that those immature seeds that are causing all the problems. So in some cases where we have not completed that domestication process, there's some very clear targets. But in the ones that are highly domesticated and it still remains, uh, it's a little more tricky. I mean, because again, we've, if we go too far in reducing dormancy, uh, then we get into pre-harvest sprouting problems and so on. So we may have gone about as far as we can there. Uh, I will say though that that in general, uh, the seed traits per se do not receive as much attention from breeders as the market traits. If you say, okay, rice, there's much more breeding on the marketability traits for rice than there is on the seed quality traits, <laughs> which, which is appropriate. But I think if a few of these quality traits would be included in the breeding target goals, we could still make more progress. Uh, but I think we're really gonna to need to use some of these, these tools where we actually measure that heterogeneity. 
if you're going to go to a breeder and say, I want you to, I want you to breed for homogeneity, you have to give the breeder a phenotype. You have to be able to measure that with seed to, with individual seed type measurements and then give a criterion that they can use as a phenotype for selection. So yeah, I think we need to provide them that. The breeders maybe need to think a little bit about seed quality. Yeah, maybe a long you. answer to your question. I hope that's, <laughs> I hope that's adequate. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And thanks for the wonderful lecture. Thank you for your question. Hello. Uh, Dr. Bent. Bent. Uh, Dr. Kent. Yes. yes. I am Dr. Vananga Mudi. A retired professor of uh, seed technology. Okay. And neither a teacher nor a researcher. Fond of uh, reading a lot of creatures, writing books, hobbies. Till now I am writing books. I had been to our campus, UC Davis campus in seven regarding the uh, e-education and e-learning program, okay, it was in 2007. And I could be able to see your paper presentation of the same topic in International Horticulture Congress 2002 this morning before coming to the session. I could be able to read only the abstract. I could not get the full paper. Okay. And my question is, how the climate warming can be related to the native population and the exotic population, passive population? And your presentation was very excellent, thought provoking. Of us, third professor, professors who are working in universities as well as uh, uh, PG scholars and PhD scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if if I understood, did you ask a question? Did you ask how climate change might affect? uh these these features that i've that i talked about was that correct yeah same thing the climate warming you know yeah with respect to temperature how it uh, influences the native population as well as the invasive population or exotic population yeah wow that's that's a very good question very very difficult one <laughs> but uh, i think we would be shocked to realize how sensitive seeds are and how precisely they can measure temperature <laughs> uh, you know i've worked a lot with lettuce seeds and two degrees centigrade they will go from 100 percent germination to zero on the high end that is we've done a lot of work on that and in the in the mini plants We've done some work on desert plants as well, very dry, hot climates. Many cases, those seeds will just not germinate above a certain temperature. It's not adaptive for them to germinate at high temperature. So I think we're going to be finding that that in the native world, you know, the the it's going to be affecting populations. Now, what's going to happen? We're already seeing, for example, native populations moving up the mountains. In other words, moving to cooler, toward cooler. Climates. Those that are as, as the temperature is getting too warm, those populations that like cooler temperatures are moving up. We're going to see shifts of native plants all around. A lot of this driven by the seeds. So again, I think the dispersal <laughs> is the key thing in the wild for certainly for annual crops, but also for the movement over the longer term. And the seeds are really exquisitely sensitive to the temperature at various parts of their life cycle during development. We know now that the temperature during development really affects the subsequent dormancy. So even while they're developing, the mother plant is influencing the seed of what it's going to anticipate for the next season. 
and if that's wrong, well, then you know that's going to be a detriment to those to those species. So I think, on the other hand, plants are quite adaptable. I think they will figure it out. <laughs> I mean, part of my story is that in fact there's an enormous range, and that's why they put that out there. That is, plants hedge their bets already, and so I think probably. Uh, in the wild also, the part of that bed hedging is genetic. In other words, we don't generally have this very uniform inbred uh, lack of heterogeneity genetically that we find in the wild. So when they, the seed dormancy allows a movement of a, of a seed, gets it established in a new location, it's very likely bringing along with it a new genotype as well <laughs> that may be more or less adapted to that new climate. So it's clear that the temperature change is going to be dramatic, and it's going to be dramatic on, particularly on wild species, but on crops as well. We're going to be see shifting where we grow certain crops. We're going to be moving the locations where cool season crops are grown, warm season crops, and so on. So, I think this is really critical. But it, you know, I can. I, what I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that seeds are going to be a really critical part of that, particularly in the wild uh, situation, because they are the, one of the key transmitters of genotypes across to these new, more adaptable, uh, more <clears throat> hospitable environments. Yeah. My doubt is, which population perform well, whether it is a native population or invasive population? Oh, well, in terms of the invasiveness versus natives, yeah, I'm not a good enough ecologist to really answer that uh, very definitively. Uh, the problem, I think, is going to be, like I said, I mean, if you have a situation where climate's warming, species are moving up. I mean, we're seeing species at the ones at the very top are going to get moved off. It's going to be too hot. The aspen, I mean, the alpine species are going to be in trouble. But if it's moving up, then it becomes, are those that are moving up invading? <laughs> are they invaders into the next climate zone. You see what I mean? It becomes like they're all fighting it out and which ones are the invaders and which ones are not. <laughs> For us, it's fairly easy if we see a, a, you know, a, an invasive weed coming in and causing problems in a place where it wasn't before. But if you're looking at a totally native, natural situation, then it's just a matter of adaptation. Which ones are the most adaptive and which one are going to take it? It may be the ones that we don't want are the ones that, that are the most adaptable and take over. So in that case, we'd say it's, it, it's invasive. It's going to be challenging. I mean, I'm not really a, a, enough of an ecologist. I've done enough to see that uh, we may have to change some definitions <laughs> as, these, as these things change. Okay, thank you very much for your... Uh... Appreciate your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this morning, I was referring an article published in French Ecology and Evolution with respect to climate warming facilities on seed germination of native and invasive species. And uh, they highlighted that the invasive population was performing well than native population under climate warming. Oh. I, I would like to share this one, okay? And my last request, I could be able to read your paper, but I could not get to the full paper. Even I tried for uh, registration, it is not accepting. I think I can mail you. Can you send that paper that was presented in International Horticultural Congress held in 2022? Yeah, I'd be glad to. The the one that, the paper for that, as far as I know, isn't published yet. I'd be happy yeah. to send you the manuscript. It's been accepted, but I don't. As far as I know, the actual act of horticultural pub, uh, book or whatever publication it's going to be in has not been published yet. But I'd be happy to send you the manuscript of it. Okay, but the problem is being a retired person. I could not be able to access the downloading of full paper. Okay. Yeah, no, I, as far as I know, the full paper may not be accessible because I haven't heard that. I, I submitted a paper and they sent me back and said, it's accepted, I haven't heard more, but I'm happy, send me an email and I'll be happy to, to share it with you. Definitely, I will be sending it. Thank okay. You. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, hello, Mr. Kent. Uh, my yes. name is Bhavya. I am from uh, uh, University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, you you told this all the seed behavior in uh, desiccation tolerant species. Uh, is this all applies to desiccation sensitive species like recalcitrant species? Uh, yeah, in a different way in that they don't develop desiccation tolerance, obviously. <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of the other parts, that is, the, the, you know, there be seeds, they have to develop, they have to go through morphology, and uh, they need to reach a certain uh, maturity. But recalcitrant seeds are often, often quite diff different. They often don't have much dormancy. They fall off the plant, they germinate immediately, uh, and so on. So, yeah, their life cycle is quite different. Uh, one, because they don't desiccate. Two, because they, they, they have, if they have dormancy, it's, it's slighter. I mean, some recalcitrant seeds like oak trees and uh, you know, in, the, in the northern climates, there are quite a few large seeds, tree seeds that are, that are more or less recalcitrant that do have some dormancy and can go through a winter, germinate again the next year. But uh, generally, most of those recalcitrant seeds are quite short-lived. Uh, and, uh, and many of them don't dry at all. I mean, mangrove seeds germinate on the mother plant and have a root out before they even fall off. So uh, uh, yeah, it's quite different. I, I have not done much with recalcitrant uh, uh, seeds, but I, you know, I know some about it. And, and there's a lot of work going on right now on this very topic of desiccation tolerance. So people more and more are studying recalcitrant seeds and resurrection plants that can, uh, plants themselves that can dry down and rehydrate because, because of the issue that was raised that the climate is gonna be changing and water is gonna be more restrictive. Uh, could we learn from those plants and those seeds how to make our crops more tolerant of uh, droughty conditions or do we learn how <clears throat> from them? <laughs> but some of those uh, uh, like resurrection plants can do the opposite. They can dry almost immediately and come back to life the uh, recalcitrant seeds can't dry at all. So between the two, we're trying to figure out mechanisms of, uh, that we can learn that we might be able to apply. Yeah. Oh, thank you for your response. Not a great answer, I'm sorry, but I don't study that very much, but you have to have a much more detailed answer, I think. Hi, sir. Myself, Abhinias, second PhD scholar from uh, Department of Seed Science and Technology, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Coimbatore. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation, sir. As a student, we have uh, gained more knowledge about a new topic. So my question is, uh, there are so many factors that influence the seed behavior, sir. But among all those factors, which factor do you think the most related one to decide the seed behavior, sir, based on your work and experience, everything? Which factor is what is the most what? So we have I missed, so many. Yeah, I missed what the, you said. Which factor is the most important or the most what? I missed the, missed the yes, one sir, word. That's my question. Because we have so many factors, sir. But uh, yeah. which factor do you think the most related one to decide its behavior, sir? Mm. Wow, it's very difficult. <laughs> uh, it kind of depends on what what behavior of the seed that you're that you're concerned with. Uh, in other words, it's hard to it's hard to compare, say, developmental traits within germin tra germination traits. So developmental traits are very critical because you're developing the the future seed. You know that's a very important traits. But in terms of uh, which traits with respect to germination are most important, again, that really depends on. Uh, you know what condition you're in, and what you're what, what you expect that to do. That is, what are what are you calling good, and what are you calling bad? So it's really hard to say what's most important. I've just been. I think the whole field is getting more and more and more complicated as as we learn more. <laughs> I was I've been doing some reading lately, and every field that you go into in seeds now, it's getting more complicated because we're digging down and we're finding oh well, there's you know, like. You think about uh, gibberellin or ABA, we thought, oh, well, this is simple. We've got these nice hormones. Well, no, each one of those has an entire network of genes that they control and subgenes under those and so on. So it is very, very complicated. It's hard to say what is the most important. I think it may be better to, to, 
not think in terms of those most, but to think more in networks and populations. Because <laughs> that's what I think is happening. That is, I'm feeling, my feeling is that plants come from an environment or a situation where they can't know exactly what's going to happen. So it's been so complicated because they are adapting to so many different things. The, the seasonal change, day night change. I mean, every seeds can sense how deep they are in the soil by the temperature change day and night. They can do all kinds of amazing things. And it's kind of hard to say, well, what is the most important? Well, you know, the most important one for one might be to avoid getting frozen. For another one, it might be to wait until the water comes and uh, the rains come. For another one, it might be something else. Another one, it might be to get eaten by a certain bird and get carried away. So uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the diversity uh, of plants enables the diversity of, of what's most important. So uh, it kind of depends on how you, you're going to define the you know, your environment. And your output and then you can say okay that's <laughs> that's what it really needs to do uh, dr kent again Wanangamudi. my request as a senior uh, retired process with your vast experience and also you have many contacts with many universities, not only in US, but also in Paris, France, and also China. I could be able to read your uh, biodata this morning. Can you help our faculties for any kind of uh, visiting faculties, either at your UC da Davis campus, it's a very nice campus, or some other universities? This is my request one. Can you again repeat? Can you be able to help our faculties currently who are working in this department for a visiting faculty mm -hmm. by exploiting some kind of uh, fellowship or you can guide them to have uh, which organization is giving a scholarship, okay? Because we are a very senior yes. most uh, professor. And the second thing, and many of our PG students are interested to pursue the higher studies in state universities like UC Davis and other things, probably the graduate and also PhD scholars. They do not know how to apply and get the scholarship. Nowadays, getting mm. scholarship is very difficult, okay? Not mm. like uh, 10 to 15 years ago. So this is my another uh, request. Please guide our head of the department or the director in these two uh, lines. So the faculty, visiting faculties. I think I hope that you worked as a visiting faculty in China as well as uh, the Paris. And also accommodating some of our uh, postgraduate students for uh, higher studies at your university or some related university that you might be knowing with your past experience and also the exposure. As a senior professor, retired professor, these are my two requests. <laughs> I take this opportunity to request these help. Thank you very much, please. I'm completely sympathetic to your request. <laughs> I don't know that I can do a whole lot. To, uh... Uh, myself, I'm, uh, you know, I'm officially retired now for several years, so I don't have much lab left, and I'm not in a position really to, uh, to take on visitors and give them a good experience because they need to come and work in the lab. But our program here, the Seed Biotechnology Center, is still functioning. In fact, uh, the professor uh, who took my place, we have a new assistant professor. He's from India, so I mean, there'd be a there'd be a close connection there if you want to uh, apply to him. So I think. Uh, we still are accepting students from all over the world. As you mentioned, the problem is the funding. We do not have a lot of fellowships either. I mean, it's not just that it's hard to apply to them. It's just there's not a lot of those around. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. I mean, uh, I think the seed industries of the world need people to be trained. It's not just for more professors and so on. There's a, you know, there's a, a need for professionals in the seed industry globally. Everybody, these, these things are important. And so I fully sympathize with your, your encouragement for students to, to, to go into this field. I, I think it's a wonderful field to go into, and I think there's plenty of jobs. <laughs> I think there's plenty of need for 
students to study seeds and there's a lot of need for uh, seed trained seed people to be working in seed companies and also in education and so on, of course. But uh, I would say if students really want to come to UC Davis and as far as apply, how to apply and so on, uh, you know, send me a note, I can direct you to the right people. Uh, just go to the websites and, and look for the graduate programs. The trick, as you say, for graduate school is to find uh, some type of funding. Usually if students can come up with even a small fellowship of some kind, it's very helpful. It's very hard here to just fully fund students with their travel and their living expenses and so on. So I can't be, you know, totally encouraging on this that we can accept a lot of people, but I know you have great people there and, and I've worked with many of them. So I think certainly the, uh, the quality of the students is not limiting. I think you should, if you feel like you want to come, uh, go ahead and apply. I mean, that's all you can, that's all you can do is apply and ask and say, I would really like to come and uh, help me find some support. Good to again. Uh, I'm Parthivan, working as an assistant professor of computer science in the office of the Dean Agriculture, TNA Coimbatore. Uh, actually, I've explored your uh, massive article, uh, as uh, mentioned by the former uh, Dean Agriculture, Dr. Vanangamudi, sir. It's massive since 1977, I believe. And it's uh, amazing, interesting, and also explored your uh, recent review article, got published in the Nature Heredity. That is a mind-blowing work and presentation. Actually, I'm working on the phenotypic variations of rice seed varieties. I'm trying to classify the uh, rice seed varieties that is on intra and interspecific variation using mm -hmm. geometric morphometrics. So that is particularly on the size and shape related aspects. And, yeah. uh, what is my question is, uh, could you please uh, throw some light on the automated seed classification and the A algorithms or instruments behind that. So if you could please uh, uh, share your views, it will be helpful for our students as well as for the faculty members. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think those methods would be very useful if you're if that's what you're doing. If it's if it's morphological uh, variation, these new uh, imaging techniques and analysis can be very, very powerful. Uh, the instrument we use, this the video meter, uh, for example, it's being, it's being uh, I work with a colleague I, who sells those from Thailand, Rhino Research, and uh, they have developed that technology to the point where uh, it's being sold throughout uh, Southeast Asia, India, everywhere to, uh, particularly with a large uh, Chinese company, CP Group, to basically replace a lot of the uh, testing that's done for quality. So this is on the grain end. I'm, I'm going to get back to your question, but on the grain end, where you're sorting seeds for insect damage and, and uh, true to type and all these different things that go into quality, they can pretty much do all of that automatically with this vision system now. So that is, they can identify the problem, they can categorize it into the category, they can estimate the weight from the shape and size and so on. They've trained the machine to estimate the weight because in the marketing world, they wanna know what's the weight fraction of damaged seed, what's the weight fraction of cracked seeds and so on. They can actually do that. So I think this technology is very, very promising for doing whatever you wanna do in the sort of morpho physical, <laughs> Uh, sort of area. Uh, I think it could be trained. Uh, the question, for example, in the Seed Testing Association is is doing uh, trueness to type and, and different varieties in a mix, you know, in a, in a seed lot. I think that can be done by these automated uh, imaging systems. Uh, so I think that the one uh, the one that we're using has only now started using the, the artificial intelligence uh, background. The other one I mentioned, and, and some others like it, uh, SeedX from Israel, really started with the AI, started with the technology, and is just using, they're just using uh, RGB, just three, three image, you know, red, blue, green uh, images. So they haven't even moved into multispectral imaging, and they're already doing pretty good. So uh, I'm quite positive about the, you know, the many ways that these uh, image analysis with particularly with multispectral image analysis and then the very detailed sort of training you can do 
uh, to these AI systems in order to get them to distinguish the features that you want. I mean, if, if we have face recognition that can distinguish, you know, one and a half billion Indian people from each other or one and a half billion Chinese people from each other, we can train them to identify seed traits. <laughs> I mean, I think the technology is there. So, uh, you know, I think if I were you, I were working in that field, I'd be interested in trying to, to look at how that would both you know, make it a lot easier for me to collect the data and to be a much more powerful uh, approach. So yes, I'm, I'm quite positive on those technologies. And I think, uh, you know, we need, need more people putting more effort into it. You know? Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Good morning, sir. I am Gayatri, PhD scholar in uh, TNAU, sir. I have one doubt, sir. Uh, you said uh, single seed exhibits transcriptional heterogeneity during the secondary dormancy induction. Uh, I have one doubt, sir, on that. Uh, whether the seeds uh, overcome uh, for primary dormancy after that secondary dormancies are induced, the same kind of transcriptional heterogeneity pattern is exhibiting or not, sir? Yeah, that's quite, that's an interesting question. I mean, they will know that. Uh, the, the, right now, the, the paper that's been published this last year is really about half technology, uh, technique. In other words, they had learned how to extract individual seeds very efficiently, uh, get good RNA from it, do the sequencing and so on. And they really have just, at large, they've published, it's just really to show the diversity variability among the different genes expressed. They've not done a whole lot about, you know, networks and so on. But so I think your question is, you know, after you induce the secondary dormancy release it, is it the same as if it had been before? That's what I understood at least. I don't think they've really, uh, it's progressed. I think they have that work in progress and we can look forward to papers from that group soon. Uh, but at this point, I don't think we know that. There's a few other groups also, a number of different seed groups are starting to move toward this single seed analysis so that we'll start to get, <clears throat> uh, in fact, we're doing some ourselves. We're gonna do a little bit different approach. We're gonna try to use our respiration measurements, for example. We'll be able to pick individual seeds that we know what they're doing. Are they, are they gonna, are, you know, we're gonna be able to pick them off and extract their RNAs right then. <laughs> so we can get them just before they germinate, we can get them just after they germinate and so on, and be able to much more precisely identify the, the transcriptional programs that are associated with all of these stages and so on. One of the problems I think uh, of a lot of the transcriptome data we have for seeds is the, what I just showed you for respiration. That is in general, people have combined a whole bunch of seeds together and you get just sort of an average view of what's happening to the transcriptome when in fact seed by seed, it's not that way at all. So I think now that we have these technologies, Seed by seed is good, cell by cell is what they're doing in a lot of medical technology and so on. Once we, it's very, it makes, it makes it a lot more complicated, but at least you get a, you know, an individual picture of what's happening. And so instead of trying, you know, you can't both get an entire transcriptome and then follow that same individual to germinate. <laughs> That's the problem. We can't get them both. We can't grind it up and also get it. So we're going to try to do the best we can where we're following seeds. We have the phenotyping. We know what we're putting into the tube and then we'll do the transcriptome and we'll try to really pick apart what the sequence of events are that are, uh, uh, you know, what networks are being turned on and so on without this averaging effect that's going on. So I guess that's the best I can say. I think we're just on the verge of that, but I'm not aware of any really, uh, really very complete data set yet that's really used the single seed or the single cell sort of more and more there's, uh, uh, reporters, I mean, there's a lot of good work with reporter genes where you can see what a particular gene is doing in the tissue. And that's also a very valuable approach. And it comes down again to cell by cell and seed by seed. But this is going to be the, you know, the next the next decade of work is going to be really uh, filling in all of that, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have read that article also, sir. And you have uh, uh, compared that uh, heterogeneity with the germination competence index. Sir. How will you calculate that germination competence index, sir? Germination competence index. I'm not really sure that I've done that, but uh, uh, yeah, 
fill in your question a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm not clear exactly what you're asking. Sir, you have mentioned that uh, we have, uh, by identifying the germination competence, uh, uh, how will you identify the germination competence? Mm. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, what we can know is <laughs> it's very hard to see if when you have a bunch of seeds, which one's going to germinate next. That's the problem. It's hard to know ahead of time which one is going to be which. I guess what I was saying is that we can, we'll at least be able to pick seeds that are have just barely germinated or on their way. But I think we'll, it depends on if we can, from our imaging or from the respiration measurements or something, we can distinguish those that are going to germinate early or late. The, we still have that issue that I still don't know what to do with, uh, which is how do, how do we know when we look now that, that what that seed's going to do later? It's a very difficult problem. Uh, frankly, I stopped working quite a bit on uh, seed aging because I could not figure out a way to efficiently determine that. <laughs> that is, if you're doing an aging test and the seeds are dying and you're grinding all the seeds together every time, an increasing fraction of your sample is made up of dead seeds that are contributing you don't know what. <laughs> so uh, until we could get methods then where you could actually, I do know a way to do that. What you could do is you can cut a seed in half and you could save one half and you could do a tetrazoleum test on the other half. And you can say, are you viable or are you not viable? Then you could go back to the other half and say, okay, you're a, you're a half of a seed from a dead seed and you're a half a seed from a viable seed and you could separate them out. <laughs> if you wanted to follow what's happening over the time course of aging. So it's very difficult. It's gonna take some pretty clever thinking and, uh, and uh, you know, thinking in these terms and understanding that I'm gonna to have to do something like that. I'm gonna to have to figure out how I can tell what a seed is, has done or is going to do in order to interpret uh, what I can understand about it. It's challenging. I mean, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of challenges at you, but I'm sure all you people are up to the challenge. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to look at this a little differently <laughs> and say, as long as we just keep combining together a lot of dead seeds and live seeds and saying the average is reality, that's not gonna work. We need to be saying, I've got a population of dead seeds and live seeds. I need to separate those out because I don't want those dead ones telling, you know, confusing me about what's going on in the other parts. <laughs> so it's a challenge. That's, that's all I can say. Think about it. And uh, if you come up with some great ideas, then I'll be looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you, sir. Hello. Yes. Hello. Good morning, sir. Hello. Uh, I, hello. Hello. Good yes, morning, I, sir. Mm -hmm. I hear uh, you. I'm Dr. Jnana Chitra, Professor Microbiology. Uh, sir, I, I want to ask one thing. Uh, currently, we are working on bioinoculants coated uh, seeds as a ready to use agro input. And um, can you give some uh, idea about the seed coat inhibitors which affect the population of the inoculated organisms? Mm. Well, that's, that's a very interesting topic. There are a lot of people working on bioinoculation and, and changing the microbiome of seeds. I have not uh, worked on it much myself. Uh, I, I have seen results that, uh, that seem promising. Uh, you're saying, you know, what do you do if there are inhibitors in the seed that block that and so on? I think that's the main issue that that field is gonna yeah. face is how do you get those, if you have organisms you want to put on, how do you get them to colonize and outcompete the ones that are already there and, uh, and take hold so that they'll have their effect. It's a different thing to take a, a bunch of microorganisms and water plants with it, put them on in high numbers and see an effect than it is to put it on a seed as a delivery system. That's gonna be tricky. I think it probably will be, you know, one strategy I would think is you may wanna think about seed priming type approaches where you're already hydrating the seeds and you're priming them, you inoculate and you get the seeds to colonize the seeds that was actually tested maybe 25 years ago and showed to have no, this, better this, effects. Uh, sir, sir we are going to develop a, a seed as a ready to use agro input coated with pre-coated with the bio inoculants in that case there are some uh, seed coat inhibitors no um respect to different seeds different crop seeds so can you give some uh, idea about the different uh, 
seed coat inhibitors the components and in what way it affects the population that's my question so, so when you say seed coat inhibitors do you mean compounds inhibitors in, yeah in the seed coat that would inhibit your microorganisms is that what you mean yeah because we yeah, are going, we are coating the bio inoculants over the seed and there yeah. are some uh, seed coat inhibitors which affect the coated bio inoculants yeah so what are all the different kind of uh, substances which are present in the seed coat inhibitors in what way it will affect oh yeah there you're into an area that i don't know much about <laughs> there are a lot of compounds and i was just reading some about oh. that today there are lots and lots of compounds depending on okay. seeds i mean for example some seeds you know the seed coat is the dormancy mechanism hard seeds that are impermeable you have seeds with all kinds of uh, uh, compounds that are allowing it to communicate with the microorganisms and fungi and so on. So that's a very complicated area. I guess, uh, again, if, if there were a great value to your bio inoculant and this, you knew what the inhibitor was, I would talk to your breeding friends and say, let's stop that seed from making that. <laughs> that is fairly, it'd be more straightforward maybe to domesticate the seed in the sense of making it uh, acceptable to your, your organisms. Uh, than trying to get at, get rid of it some other way. I think you know genetically, if you could could block that pathway or something. You know, I can just mention a, briefly. Uh, one of my colleagues has done some very interesting work here, related to that, which is to encourage free living nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the soil to colonize the root. And he did that by getting the roots to produce a compound which would encourage those bacteria to make biofilms and colonize the roots. So another way to, to think about that is what could we do to the plants that would make them more encouraging to those, uh, to your, your bio inoculant uh, to grow and, and so on. It's not the same question you ask, but I just say there's another strategy as yes, well. Sir. <laughs> yes, sir. yes. Sir. I really don't know anything about okay, the sir, inhibitors no that are in seeds. <laughs> Dr. Kent. Okay, sir. Yes. Thank you. Can I can I uh, interact with this uh, question with uh, Dr. Nana Chitra? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Nangamudi. And the seed inhibitors does not have any role on seed coating or seed pelleting or seed priming. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, some seeds like fenugreek, they have seed coat inhibitors, um, the cow marine. And some of the seeds, those seeds which have dormancy with relation to seed coat influence, uh, only after giving treatment for the dormancy, we will be giving any kind of treatment, whether it's a seed coating or priming, whatever it may be, okay? And Dr. Okay. Nanachitra and the Department of Sir. Seed Science and Technology has done a lot of work on liquid biofertilizers and biocontrol agents since 2000 onwards. You may contact either Dr. Manon Mani or Dr. Umarani. She has done a lot of work. Okay. Umarani has done a lot okay. of work with almost all agriculture crops and horticulture crops with respect to priming with biocontrol okay. agents, as well as the bioinoculants. I'm sorry, Dr. Kent, for intervening and answering for this question. <laughs> uh, can you satisfied with this uh, answer, uh, Dr. Nana Chitra? Sir, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. You may but I just want to know, uh, oh, sure, sir, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank I am now out of uh, the research or the <laughs> teacher. Teaching, okay. No issues, sir. No issues, sir. sir. I'll contact some madam. Of the sir. and other things. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Related to after this, sir. So because you have know, explained the C K D time model and that what we have in a weather forecast model. So like that, uh, is it any possibility for otherwise already it is there means uh, can be used in more than C or C bigger model. So. So that we can monitor the 
successful model or successful uh, application is there in following any other analysis or issues? The sound was bad. I really didn't. Yeah. If someone could interpret that for me, I could. I couldn't really hear it at all. If it's coming to me. Yeah, I'm so I'm sorry. Could somebody with the microphone repeat that for Dr. me? Alex? So who is that, Dr. Alex? Yes, sir. Yeah, your yes, sir. voice is not clear. The question is not clear. Okay. Sir, he is asking, is there any model uh, model to assess the bigger of the seed lot? Sir, uh, is there any model to assess the bigger of the seed lot, he is asking? Ah, yeah. a, a, a way to assess the vigor of the seed lot. Is that the question? Yes, sir. Yeah, is there yeah. any model? Is there any model to assess the vigor of seed lot? Ah. Well, I have my own opinions on vigor, so I will tell you them now. <laughs> my view is that the main factor of vigor is the speed of germination. Okay. <laughs> that is, if you do a vigor test, let's say you do a growth test, you plant everything and you grow them for 10 days and you measure the seedlings. And the high vigor one will be bigger than the, than the low vigor ones. My argument is most of that difference is because those seeds germinated earlier and had more days to grow. <laughs> if some seeds germinated on day four and grew to day 10, they got six days. If they didn't germinate until day seven, they only had three days to grow. Because we've done experiments where if you take seeds that are aging and are slowing down, but after they germinate, you give them the same amount of time to grow, they grow almost the same rate. So. We tend to think that vigor is about growth rate after germination, but vigor, as far as the seed is concerned, is almost entirely in speed of germination. So that's my thesis. So that's why we spend a lot of time measuring speed of germination. The problem is that, again, is hard. To, nobody will do that because it's tedious. So an endpoint test is fine, but just remember that what you're measuring is actually an indirect measure of when those seed germinated, okay? I see a lot of things about saying low vigor seeds are gonna give you slow growing plants in the fields. They're slow only because they're behind. They're behind because they're slow to get out of the ground. But I don't, I have never, I have not seen, in fact, I've seen several studies now with very precise imaging measurements of root growth and so on. Seeds that are, that are slow or aged, if they germinate and you give them all the same time to grow, they grow remarkably similarly. So again, I, I focus now, I think the most, to me, vigor per se means focusing on germination speed, which means you need to do frequent tests. That is an early count. I think an early count, if you're gonna just do the usual standard test, I would put a lot of emphasis on the early count, less on the late count, <laughs> if you wanna know about vigor. So the earlier you can count and get timing, to me, that's vigor. Professor again, good evening. So this is Dr. Rivera from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. I need your opinion on one of the basic uh, seed sense concept. So at present uh, that uh, seed lot quality is assessed on sample basis. So whatever that results, we are going to get that particular sample. Based on that, we are offering some treatment for that uh, entire seed lot, particularly that uh, insecticide and fungicide treatment. Mm. So uh, uh, that lot may have some seeds may have a pathogen infections and many of them are not having any pathogen infection. Uh, or uh, without knowing all those things, we are offering the treatment for entire seeds. What is your opinion on this? Not only this uh, pathogen, uh, the per seed quality enhancement, that is seed germination enhancement also, we are offering that uh, GA3 treatment, all those things. Some of the seeds are, uh, so without that GA3, they have a potential to germinate within that lot. Some of them need up some GA3. Some of them are needing a higher amount. But in all the cases, we are offering uh, uh, that particular treatment at a particular dose. What's your opinion on this? 
Yeah, those are very good questions. And uh, it, it's, it's always an issue in seeds. Uh, the sample that you take is the most critical thing. <laughs> that is, uh, you know, if you just go to a giant bin and you take a few off the top, that's not it. You have to probe the entire bin, <laughs> mix it all together, and then mix, mix, mix to make sure that you get an, ac an accurate sample of the overall thing. So, I mean, that, that's very challenging, but that's, that's step number one. The second thing you mentioned, I've only recently become kind of thinking about is, is, as you say, if you do a sample and you say, okay, I've got a certain pathogen in there, I can give a certain treatment and try to kill those. Well, what I've told you about seeds, that's also the case for the pathogen, that they are variable and they have different thresholds. So you may be give enough, you may give a dose that you say will kill 90% of the pathogen. You may have left then the most resistant fraction to grow again, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So in a sense, uh, I think it's a big issue that we need to think about. That is, you don't want to just way overdose things and kill, try to kill everything because then you use way too much pesticide. On the other hand, this population story I told you applies equally well to the fungi or the bacteria as it does to the seeds. That is, there's an enormous, even more so, there's enormous range of variability in microorganisms that we're dealing with. And if we try to give it one shot, one treatment, then you know it's more effective than nothing, but we need to think about that. It's very difficult to do the whole thing. What, what I've, I could give a whole nother lecture on this, but <laughs> uh, we're big advocates for preventing those types of problems, insects, diseases, and so on in seeds of drying the seeds to low moisture contents and then sealing them from the environment. So all you need is, uh, you know, sealable containers, plastic bags, whatever can keep them from the humidity. And you need a drying system to get them really dry because neither insects nor fungi will grow or bacteria really will grow at low relative humidities, low moisture contents. So, uh, and you don't need pesticides then. So that would be my, <laughs> I would take a different strategy uh, to avoid those uses, but that requires other technology, but it's simple technology. Dry the seeds, make it dry and keep it dry use dry tank te technology and, and try to, uh, to deal with it that way. So that, that's my two opinions. One, it is a real big problem. Two, think about drying if you're having insect and, uh, and pathogen problems in stored seeds. Thank you very much. One more question uh, with reference to that uh, uh, consumer point of view. So at present, the people, they are consuming uh, grains for edible mm. purpose. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, but uh, but there's a seed is alive. Mostly we are using that one for sowing. Whenever that loses its viability, that is converted for the consumption mm. purpose. Mm. But uh, um, I did some work on this, uh, particularly in the case of peanut. Um, uh, that uh, whatever that uh, seed that our uh, that uh, the material that our viability, that pound to have some good amount of protein, some useful proteins and useful oils and uh, some useful carbohydrate when compared to grains. Um, but why the people they are recommending grain alone for consumption? Why we are not recommending seed? Also, it's a it's a viability. Also, it's a mandatory quality parameter for uh, making that material as a consumable one. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any real reason not to that you couldn't eat old grains, but I wouldn't want to eat them if they'd been treated with pesticides. So that's <laughs> that's the point. So uh, yeah, peanuts peanuts are a problem. You know, I will say that we did a little bit of, of, of indirect work on that. And in peanuts, particularly in some others, you do have certain fungi like aflatoxins that will leave toxins uh, that are not good, either in grain or, or you, if they were seeds, you wouldn't want to uh, consume them because of the aflatoxins, or fumonisins, other types of mycotoxins that are in them. And again, this would be another argument to me for for right at harvest as soon as possible, dry the seeds below the level that fungi can grow, which is below about 65% relative humidity, or it depends upon the different uh, oil content, what that would equilibrate to and moisture content. But if you can get them dry enough, then you stop further development of those fungi as well that make toxins. So uh, I have a different view on that. I, I'm a big advocate for, let's try to, to move as quickly as we can for both grains and seeds particularly in humid environments like you have there, 
get them out of the field, get them very dry, and then get them into containers that protect them because they will absorb moisture back from the air. So you have to dry them and then protect them. And, uh, and then going back and forth between being a seed or being a grain to eat is very simple because you're not using pesticides then to control those, uh, control those organisms. And both of them will store much longer. The grain, the nutritional quality is preserved or the viability for seed is preserved. I'm directing your question a little different way, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, trying to proselytize a little bit for, uh, for drying. Anybody have who questions, both online and offline? Okay, well, uh, sir, this is Manon Mani, Professor. I want to ask a very simple, uh, simple question. In your presentation, you have mentioned about the uh, germination performance and uh, plant blindness. Yeah, well, yeah. what is uh, plant blindness and uh, what is the causes for plant blindness and how you correlate this germination performance with the plant blindness? Oh, this is very simple. Yeah, process. yeah. Well, the blindness, the blindness is a is a disorder where you plant you plant the plants. In the case I'm describing, it usually occurs when you plant and then you have a cold spell. Like if for us, like if we plant it in a warm region, but region and then there's a cold spell, then you'll see many of these plants come up. And what it is is a, it's a failure of the meristem at the, to grow. In other words, the meristem just does not develop and it doesn't continue to make new leaves and new stems. So you just end up with the cotyledons, one or two leaves, and then they just quit. That's why they call them a blind plant. They just are, they don't grow. <laughs> and so this is a problem when you, when that happens in the field, well, then the, the uh, grower is not very happy and they blame the seeds. The connection with germination, uh, you know, often it's not a germination problem per se, uh, but what we discovered was that, that the ones that were more susceptible to this were the more immature seeds. So this was really more of a question of using the imaging technologies that we could do to look for maturity, look for chlorophyll, look for maturity, because what we found was that immature seeds were the ones that were much more susceptible to being induced into this blindness. Okay, so basically what it said, if you want to have it reduce the risk as a seed seller that you're going to have a problem and have blind seeds show up in the field, eliminate those immature seeds from the population. There wasn't that much connection per se between the germination per se under good conditions. I mean, they, you, you often don't notice that, uh, that maturity difference so much, uh, but it was clearly evident whenever we did this induction treatment. We have to give them a cold treatment, imbibe them at cold temperature and hold them and then test them later. And uh, those that were immature either died or much more susceptible to this blindness. You may never have a cold, you may never, you don't have cold spells, maybe you don't have that problem. Thank you, sir, for your nice explanation. Yes. Sir, I am Dr. Renya Devi, uh, TNAO. Uh, whether the behavior of seeds present in the soil seed bank fit in with the mathematical model, sir? Seeds of soil seed bank. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I haven't done much of that myself, but we've done somewhat. I mean, uh, uh, early on, there was quite a lot of work by colleagues on uh, certain invasive species that made seeds in the soil bank and so on. They showed that the model worked perfectly well. It, it, may, it worked really good for them. Uh, we've also done a little bit of work with uh, weeds that grow in rice fields, for example. Uh, and so you can use the model, for example, to define the temperature ranges for germination. So if you have annual weeds, uh, you can test their germination. You can predict then what periods they're going to emerge so you can use your do your uh, control treatments different things like that so as far as we can see uh, yes I would say yes it would work it just depends on what factors you look at that is we have a model for temperature we have a model for water potential you can combine those into a hydrothermal model so it just depends on uh, what the conditions are of the you know the, the seed bank species you're interested in what they're waiting I mean, in a seed bank, you can have seeds that are will germinate at low temperature, others that are wanting high temperature. <laughs> so it depends on really what you're after, but you can, what you can do is you can connect 
the testing that you do and the modeling you do and the parameters you determine from that. And then if you know what the environmental parameters are, you can connect those. You can say, okay, this is the range of temperature that that seed is waiting for and is most likely to germinate in. And you can go, when that happens in the field, you're measuring soil temperatures or whatever, that's when it's gonna happen. Is there any more uh, clarifications or doubt? Okay, if you, yeah, almost we have uh, come to the end of the session. Yeah, before uh, giving the formal vote of thanks, I request all our uh, students and faculty to please stand up and give a great, uh, great applause to our uh, Dr. Ken. <laughs> Many thanks to you. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate your thoughtful questions and. Uh... I wish you all well. I, I, it's, it's great for me to see uh, however many 40 or 50 seed scientists. I love it. <laughs> yeah, please be with us uh, for a few minutes, sir. Formal water plan. Okay. Next, we would like to invite Dr. R. Jalin, Professor, Department of Seed Science and Technology, to offer formal vote of thanks. Respected and Honorable Vice Chancellor, Respected Dean, School Postgraduate Studies, Respected Director, Seed Center, and Respected Professor and Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, TNAU, and the distinguished guest speaker of today's event, Dr. Kent Bradford, Respected Former Dean Agri and our Professor and Head, Dr. K. Vanangamudi, and uh, all the participants who have joined online and offline for this uh, great lecture, student friends and other staff members. Good afternoon and good evening to Dr. Kent. So I'm here to propose the formal vote of thanks. So first of all, we would like to thank profusely our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Madam, for according permission and the wholehearted support for conduct of this Golden Jubilee Global Lecture Series by the Department of Seed Science and Technology, TNAU, Coimthor. Our heartfelt gratitude to our Dean SPGS for his keen interest in participating in this program and offering the special address. We profusely thank the Director Seed Center for her constant encouragement and all for, and for all the arrangement of this lecture series and unconditional support for the conduct of this particular lecture. And it is our bounden duty to thank our Professor Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, Coimbatore, for her overall guidance and appreciative efforts in arrangement of all these lecture series. So it's our great privilege to wholeheartedly thank today's guest speaker, Dr. Kent Bradford, an eminent physiologist for accepting our invitation, sparing his valuable time and for sharing his vast and rich experience on seed behavior. Sir, your enriched knowledge on seed population dynamics has enlightened all the participants with various aspects of seed biology. We, we really thankful for your amazing lecture, sir. So our gratitude are to the participants who envies their keen interest in participating in this lecture through offline and online from various places and also for their active involvement in the interaction. Our special thanks are due to our former Dean Agri and uh, Professor and Head Department of Seed Science and Technology, Dr. K. Manangamudi. He showed his keen interest in coming over here and attending this lecture and sharing his experience also. Our thanks are due to the students and all the other staff members of Department of Seed Science and Technology and Seed Center for their keen support in organizing this lecture. We also thank Dean SPGS for providing this uh, public defense hall for conduct of this program, and also the professor and head, Department of Physical Science and uh, Information Technology for extending the technical support for successful conduct of this great event. Thanks one and all. Thank you, Kent. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Congratulations yeah, yeah, yeah. on your congratulations you. on your golden anniversary. <laughs> okay. You made a day very fruitful for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank
Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Good day to all of you. Okay. Thank you everyone for making this occasion a great success. With this, we are completing this session and the session is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.